Chapter 7 The Philosopher's Education and the Analogy of the Ship And now, I said, let me show in a figure how far our nature is enlightened or unenlightened, behold. Human beings living in an underground den, which has an opening towards the light and extending all along the den, here they have been from their childhood, and have their legs and necks chained so that they cannot move, and can only see before them, being prevented by the chains from turning around their heads. Above and behind them a fire is blazing at a distance, and between the fire and the prisoners there is a raised pathway, and you will see, if you look, a low wall built along the pathway, like the screen which puppet players have in front of them, over which they show the puppets. I see, said Socrates. And do you see, I said, people passing along the wall, carrying all sorts of containers, and statues, and figures of animals made of wood and stone and various materials, which appear over the wall? Some of them are talking, others silent. You have shown me a strange image, and they are strange prisoners. Like ourselves, I replied, and they see only their own reflections, or the reflections of one another, which the fire throws on the opposite wall of the cave. True, he said, how could they see anything but the reflections if they were never allowed to move their heads? And of the objects which are being carried in the same way, they would only see the reflections. Yes, he said. And if they were able to converse with one another, would they not suppose that they were naming what was actually before them? Very true. And suppose further that the prison had an echo which came from the other side, would they not be sure to think when one of the passers-by spoke that the voice which they heard came from the passing reflection? No question, he replied. To them, I said, the truth would be literally nothing but the reflections of the images. That is certain. And now look again and see what will naturally follow if the prisoners are released and disabused of their error. At first, when any of them is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his neck around and walk and look towards the light, he will experience sharp pains, the glare will distress him, and he will be unable to see the realities of which in his former state he had seen the reflections, and then imagine someone saying to him that what he saw before was an illusion, but that now... When he is approaching closer to reality, and his eye is turned towards more real existence, he has a clearer vision, what will be his reply? And you may further imagine that his instructor is pointing to the objects as they pass and requiring him to name them, will he not be perplexed? Will he not think that the reflections which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are now shown to him? Far truer, replied Socrates. And if he is forced to look directly at the light, won't he experience pain in his eyes that will make him turn away and seek refuge in the objects of vision that he can see, which he will believe to be clearer than the things that are currently being shown to him? True, he said. And suppose once more that he is reluctantly dragged up a steep and rugged ascent, and held there until he is forced into the presence of the sun itself, won't he likely be pained and irritated? When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dazzled, and he won't be able to see anything that is currently considered reality. Not all at once, he said. He will need to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world. And first, he will see the reflections best, then the images of men and other objects in the water, and then the objects themselves. Then he will gaze upon the light of the moon and the stars and the spangled sky. And he will see the sky and the stars at night better than the sun or the light of the sun during the day. Certainly. Lastly, he will be able to see the sun itself, and not just reflections of it in the water. He will see the sun in its own proper place, and not in another place. And he will contemplate the sun as it truly is. Certainly. He will then argue that the sun is the one who gives the seasons and the years and is the guardian of everything in the visible world. In a certain way, he is the cause of everything that he and his fellow prisoners have been accustomed to see. Clearly, he said. He would first see the sun and then reason about it. And when he remembers his old dwelling and the wisdom of the cave and his fellow prisoners, do you not suppose that he would congratulate himself on the change and pity them? Certainly, he would. 
And if they were in the habit of giving honors to those among themselves who were quickest to observe the passing reflections and to note which ones came before and which ones followed after, and which ones were together, and those who were therefore best able to draw conclusions about the future, do you think you would care for such honors and glories, or envy those who possess them? Wouldn't he rather say, like Homer, better to be the poor servant of a poor master, and endure anything, rather than think as they do and live their way of life? Yes, he said, I think he would rather suffer anything than entertain these false notions and live in this miserable manner. Imagine once more, I said, such a person coming suddenly out of the sun and being placed back in his old situation. Wouldn't he be certain to have his eyes filled with darkness? To be sure, he said. And if there were a contest, and he had to compete with the prisoners who had never left the cave in measuring the reflections, while his sight was still weak and before his eyes had become steady, and the time needed to acquire this new habit of sight might be quite long, wouldn't he be ridiculous? People would say that he went up and came back down without his eyes, and that it was better not even to think of ascending. And if anyone tried to free another and lead him up to the light, they would only catch the offender and put him to death. No doubt, he said. You can now add this whole story, dear Glaucon, to the previous argument. The prison is the world of sight, the light of the fire is the sun, and you will not misunderstand me if you interpret the journey upwards as the ascent of the soul into the intellectual world, according to my humble belief, which I have expressed at your request, whether rightly or wrongly, only God knows. But, whether true or false, in the world of knowledge, the concept of good appears last of all, and is seen only with effort. And when it is seen, it is understood to be the universal creator of all things beautiful and right, the parent of light and the ruler of light in this visible world, and the immediate source of reason and truth in the intellectual world. And this is the power upon which anyone who wants to act rationally, whether in public or private life, must have their eye fixed. I agree, he said, as far as I am able to understand you. Furthermore, I said, you must not be surprised that those who attain to this blissful vision are unwilling to descend to human affairs. For their souls are always yearning to dwell in the upper world, which is a very natural desire, if we can trust our story. Teacher, do you think you would care for such honors and glories, or envy those who possess them? Yes, very natural. And is it surprising if someone who transitions from divine contemplations to the evil state of man behaves in a ridiculous manner? If, while their eyes are blinking and before they have become accustomed to the surrounding darkness, they are compelled to fight in courts of law or in other places about the images or the shadows of images of justice, and try to understand the ideas of those who have never yet seen absolute justice? Anything but surprising, he replied. Anyone who has common sense will remember that the confusions of the eyes come from two causes, either from coming out of the light or from going into the light. This is true of the mind's eye just as much as the physical eye. And he who remembers this when he sees someone whose vision is perplexed and weak will not be too quick to laugh. He will first ask whether that person's soul has come out of the brighter life and is unable to see because it is unaccustomed to the darkness, or if, having turned from darkness to the day, the person is dazzled by the excessive light. And he will consider the one happy in his condition and state of being, and he will pity the other, or, if he has a mind to laugh at the soul which comes from below into the light, there will be more reason in this than in the laugh which greets him who returns from above out of the light into the den. That, Socrates said, is a very fair distinction. But then, if I am right, certain teachers of education must be wrong when they say that they can put knowledge into the soul which was not there before, like sight into blind eyes. They undoubtedly say this, he replied. Whereas, our argument shows that the power and capacity of learning exists in the soul already, and that just as the eye was unable to turn from darkness to light without the whole body, so too the instrument of knowledge can only by the movement of the whole soul be turned from the world of becoming into that of being, and learn gradually to endure the sight of being, and of the brightest and best of being, or in other words, of the good. Very true. And must there not be some art which will effect conversion in the easiest and quickest manner, not implanting the faculty of sight, for that exists already, 
but has been turned in the wrong direction, and is looking away from the truth? Yes, he said, such an art may be presumed. And whereas the other so-called virtues of the soul seem to be akin to bodily qualities, for even when they are not originally innate, they can be implanted later by habit and exercise, the virtue of wisdom more than anything else contains a divine element which always remains, and by this conversion is rendered useful and profitable, or, on the other hand, hurtful and useless. Did you never observe the narrow intelligence flashing from the keen eye of a clever rogue, how eager he is, how clearly his paltry soul sees the way to his end, he is the opposite of blind, but his keen eyesight is forced into the service of evil, and he is mischievous in proportion to his cleverness? Very true, he said. But what if there had been a purification of such natures in the days of their youth, and they had been separated from those sensual pleasures, such as eating and drinking, which, like heavy weights, were attached to them at their birth, and which dragged them down and turned the vision of their souls towards the things that are below, if, I say, they had been released from these obstacles and turned in the opposite direction, the very same faculty in them would have seen the truth as keenly as they. See what their eyes are turned to now. Very likely. Yes, I said, and there is another thing which is likely, or rather a necessary conclusion from what has come before, that neither the uneducated and uninformed of the truth, nor yet those who never cease their education, will be able ministers of state, not the former, because they have no single aim of duty which is the rule of all their actions, private as well as public, nor the latter, because they will not act at all except upon compulsion, imagining that they are already living a part in the islands of the blessed. Very true, he replied. Then, I said, the task of us who are the founders of the state will be to compel the best minds to attain that knowledge which we have already shown to be the greatest of all. They must continue to ascend until they arrive at the good, but when they have ascended and seen enough we must not allow them to do as they do now. What do you mean? I mean that they remain in the upper world, but this must not be allowed. They must be made to descend again among the prisoners in the den, and partake of their labors and honors, whether they are worth having or not. But is not this unjust? He said, ought we to give them a worse life, when they might have a better? You have again forgotten, my friend, I said, the intention of the legislator, who did not aim at making any one class in the state happy above the rest, the happiness was to be in the whole state, and he held the citizens together by persuasion and necessity, making them benefactors of the state and therefore benefactors of one another, to this end he created them, not to please themselves, but to be his instruments in binding up the state. True, he said, I had forgotten. Observe, Glaucon, that there will be no injustice in compelling our philosophers to have a care and providence of others, we shall explain to them that in other states, men of their class are not obliged to share in the toils of politics, and this is reasonable, for they grow up at their own sweet will and the government would rather not have them. Being self-taught, they cannot be expected to show any gratitude for a culture which they have never received. But we have brought you into the world to be rulers of the hive, kings of yourselves and of the other citizens, and have educated you far better and more perfectly than they have been educated, and you are better able to share in the double duty. Wherefore each of you, when his turn comes, must go down to the general underground abode, and get the habit of seeing in the dark. When you have acquired the habit, you will see ten thousand times better than the inhabitants of the den, and you will know what the several images are, and what they represent, because you have seen the beautiful and just and good in their truth. And thus, our state, which is also yours, will be a reality, and not a dream only, and will be administered in a spirit unlike that of other states, in which men fight with one another about shadows only and are distracted in the struggle for power, which in their eyes is a great good. Whereas the truth is that the state in which the rulers are most reluctant to govern is always the best and most quietly governed, and the state in which they are most eager, the worst. Quite true. And will our pupils, when they hear this, refuse to take their turn at the toils of state, when they are allowed to spend the greater part of their time with one another in the heavenly light? Impossible, for they are just men, and the commands which we impose upon them are just. There can be no doubt that every one of them will take office as a stern necessity, and not after the fashion of our present rulers of state. 
Yes, my friend, and there lies the point. You must contrive for your future rulers another and a better life than that of a ruler, and then you may have a well-ordered state. For only in the state which offers this will they rule who are truly rich, not in silver and gold, but in virtue and wisdom, which are the true blessings of life. Whereas if they go to the administration of public affairs, poor and hungering after their own private advantage, thinking that hence they are to snatch the chief good, order there can never be. For they will be fighting about office, and the civil and domestic broils which thus arise will be the ruin of the rulers themselves and of the whole state. Most true. And the only life which looks down upon the life of political ambition is that of true philosophy. Do you know of any other? Indeed, I do not. And those who govern ought not to be lovers of the task? For, if they are, there will be rival lovers, and they will fight. No question. Who then are those whom we shall compel to be guardians? Surely, they will be the men who are wisest about affairs of state, and by whom the state is best administered, and who at the same time have other honors and another and a better life than that of politics. They are the men, and I will choose them. And now shall we consider in what way such guardians will be produced, and how they are to be brought from darkness to light, as some are said to have ascended from the world below to the gods. By all means. The process, I said, is not the turning over of an oyster shell, but the turning round of a soul passing from a day, which is little better than night, to the true day of being, that is, the ascent from below, which we affirm to be true philosophy. Quite so. And should we not inquire what sort of knowledge has the power of effecting such a change? Certainly. What sort of knowledge is there which would draw the soul from becoming to being? And another consideration has just occurred to me, you will remember that our young men are to be warrior athletes? Yes, that was said. Then this new kind of knowledge must have an additional characteristic? What characteristic? Usefulness in war. Yes, if possible. There were two parts in our former system of education, were there not? Just so. There was physical education, which oversaw the growth and decay of the body, and may therefore be regarded as having to do with reproduction and decay? True. Then that is not the knowledge which we are seeking to discover? No. But what do you say of music, which also played a role to some extent in our former system? Music, as you will remember, was the counterpart of physical education, and trained the guardians by the influences of habit, by harmony making them harmonious, by rhythm rhythmical, but not giving them science. And the words, whether fabulous or possibly true, had kindred elements of rhythm and harmony in them. But in music, there was nothing which tended to that good which you are now seeking. You are most accurate, I said, in your recollection. In music, there certainly was nothing of the kind. But what branch of knowledge is there, my dear Glaucon, which is of the desired nature, since all the useful arts were considered inferior by us? Undoubtedly. And yet, if music and physical education are excluded, and the arts are also excluded, what remains? Well, I said, there may be nothing left of our special subjects. And then we shall have to take something which is not special, but of universal application. What may that be? A something which all arts and sciences and intelligences use in common, and which everyone first must learn among the elements of education. What is that? The little matter of distinguishing one, two, and three, in a word, number, and calculation. Do not all arts and sciences necessarily partake of them? Yes. Then the art of war partakes of them? To be sure. Then Polymedes, whenever he appears in tragedy, proves Agamemnon ridiculously unfit to be a general. Did you never remark how he declares that he had invented number, and had numbered the ships and set in array the ranks of the army at Troy? Which implies that they had never been numbered before and Agamemnon must be supposed literally to have been incapable of counting his own feet, how could he if he was ignorant of number? And if that is true, what sort of general must he have been? I should say a very strange one, if this was as you say. Can we deny that a warrior should have a knowledge of arithmetic? 
Certainly, he should, if he is to have the smallest understanding of military tactics, or indeed, I should rather say, if he is to be a man at all. I should like to know whether you have the same notion which I have of this study. What is your notion? It appears to me to be a study of the kind which we are seeking, and which leads naturally to reflection, but never to have been rightly used. For the true use of it is simply to draw the soul towards being. Will you explain your meaning, he said. I will try, I said. And I wish you would share the inquiry with me and say yes or no when I attempt to distinguish in my own mind what branches of knowledge have this attracting power, in order that we may have clearer proof that arithmetic is, as I suspect, one of them. Explain, he said. I mean to say that objects of sense are of two kinds, some of them do not invite thought because the sense is an adequate judge of them, while in the case of other objects sense is so untrustworthy that further inquiry is imperatively demanded. You are clearly referring, he said, to the manner in which the senses are imposed upon by distance, and by painting in light and shade. No, I said, that is not at all my meaning. Then what is your meaning? When speaking of uninviting objects, I mean those which do not pass from one sensation to the opposite. Inviting objects are those which do. In this latter case, the sense coming upon the object, whether at a distance or near, gives no more vivid idea of anything than of its opposite. An illustration will make my meaning clearer. Here are three fingers, a little finger, a second finger, and a middle finger. Very good. You may suppose that they are seen quite close, and here comes the point. What is it? Each of them equally appears a finger, whether seen in the middle or at the extremity, whether white or black, or thick or thin, it makes no difference, a finger is a finger all the same. In these cases, a man is not compelled to ask of thought the question what a finger is. For the sight never intimates to the mind that a finger is other than a finger. True. And therefore, I said, as we might expect, there is nothing here which invites or excites intelligence. There is not, he said. But is this equally true of the size and smallness of the fingers? Can sight adequately perceive them? And is no difference made by the circumstance that one of the fingers is in the middle and another at the extremity? And in like manner does the touch adequately perceive the qualities of thickness or thinness, of softness or hardness? And so, of the other senses, do they give perfect indications of such matters? Is not their mode of operation on this wise? The sense which is concerned with the quality of hardness is necessarily concerned also with the quality of softness, and only intimates to the soul that the same thing is felt to be both hard and soft? You are quite right, he said. And must not the soul be perplexed at this intimation which the sense gives of a hard which is also soft? What, again, is the meaning of light and heavy, if that which is light is also heavy, and that which is heavy, light? Yes, he said, these indications which the soul receives are very curious and require to be explained. Yes, I said, and in these confusing situations the soul naturally calls upon calculation and intelligence to help her, so she can determine whether the various objects presented to her are one or two. True. And if they turn out to be two, isn't each of them distinct and different? Certainly. And if each is one, and both are two, she will perceive the two as divided, because if they were undivided, they could only be perceived as one? True. The eye did see both small and large, but only in a confused manner, they were not distinguished. Yes. Whereas the thinking mind, in its attempt to bring order to the chaos, had to reverse the process and see small and large as separate and not confused. Very true. This was the beginning of the inquiry into what is great and what is small. Exactly. And thus, the distinction between the visible and the intelligible arose. Most true. This is what I meant when I mentioned impressions that invite the intellect, or the opposite, those that are simultaneous with opposite impressions invite thought while those that are not simultaneous do not. I understand, he said, and I agree with you. And to which category do unity and number belong? I don't know, he replied. 
Think a little, and you will see that what has been said before will provide the answer, because if simple unity could be adequately perceived by sight or any other sense, then, as we mentioned in the case of the finger, there would be nothing to attract towards existence. But when there is always some contradiction present, and one is the opposite of one and implies the concept of plurality, then thought begins to arise within us, and the soul, perplexed and wanting to decide, asks what is absolute unity. This is how the study of unity has the power to draw and convert the mind to the contemplation of true existence. And surely, he said, this occurs notably in the case of unity, because we see the same thing to be both one and infinite in multitude? Yes, I said, and this is true of all numbers as well, right? Certainly. And all arithmetic and calculation have to do with numbers? Yes. And they seem to lead the mind towards truth? Yes, in a very remarkable way. Then this is the kind of knowledge we are seeking, with a double use, military, and philosophical. The warrior must learn the art of numbers, or he will not know how to arrange his troops. And the philosopher, too, because he has to rise above the ever-changing world and grasp true existence, therefore he must be an arithmetician. That is true. And our guardian is both a warrior and a philosopher? Certainly. Then this is a kind of knowledge that legislation may rightly prescribe, and we must persuade those who are to be the leaders of our state to go and learn arithmetic, not as amateurs, but to continue studying until they can understand the nature of numbers with their minds only. Not for the purpose of buying or selling, like merchants or traders, but for the sake of their military use and for the sake of the soul itself. Because this will be the easiest way for the soul to transition from becoming to truth and existence. That is excellent, he said. Yes, I said, and now that I have spoken of it, I must add how fascinating the science of arithmetic is. And in how many ways it contributes to our desired goal, if pursued with the mindset of a philosopher and not that of a shopkeeper. What do you mean? I mean, as I was saying, that arithmetic has a very profound and uplifting effect, forcing the soul to reason about abstract numbers and resisting the introduction of visible or tangible objects into the argument. You know how steadfastly the masters of the art reject and mock anyone who attempts to divide absolute unity when calculating, and if you divide, they multiply, making sure that one remains one and doesn't get lost in fractions. That is very true. Now, suppose someone were to ask them, Oh my friends, what are these remarkable numbers that you are reasoning about, in which, as you say, there is a unity that you demand, and each unit is equal, unchanging, and indivisible, what would they answer? They would answer, as I understand it, that they were speaking of those numbers that can only be realized in thought. Then you see that this knowledge can truly be called necessary, as it clearly requires the use of pure intelligence in the pursuit of pure truth? Yes, that is a distinctive characteristic of it. And have you also observed that those who have a natural talent for calculation are generally quick at every other kind of knowledge? And even the slow ones, if they have received training in arithmetic, although they may not derive any other advantage from it, always become much quicker than they would have otherwise been. Very true, he said. And indeed, you will not easily find a more challenging study, and not many as challenging. You will not. And for all these reasons, arithmetic is a kind of knowledge in which the best individuals should be trained and should not be abandoned. I agree. Let this, then, be one of our subjects of education. And next, shall we inquire whether the related science is also relevant to us? You mean geometry? Exactly. Clearly, he said, we are concerned with that part of geometry that relates to war. Because in setting up a camp, taking a position, closing or extending the lines of an army, or any other military maneuver, whether in actual battle or on a march, it will make all the difference whether a general is or is not a geometer. Yes, I said, but for that purpose a very little of either math or calculation will be enough, the question relates rather to the greater and more advanced part of math, whether that tends in any degree to make more easy the vision of the idea of good, and thither, as I was saying, all things tend which compel the soul to turn her gaze towards that place, 
where is the full perfection of being, which she ought, by all means, to behold. True, he said. Then if math compels us to view being, it concerns us, if becoming only, it does not concern us? Yes, that is what we assert. Yet anybody who has the least acquaintance with math will not deny that such a conception of the science is in flat contradiction to the ordinary language of mathematicians. How so? They have in view practice only, and are always speaking, in a narrow and ridiculous manner, of squaring and extending and applying and the like. They confuse the necessities of math with those of daily life, whereas knowledge is the real object of the whole science. Certainly, he said. Then must not a further admission be made? What admission? That the knowledge at which math aims is knowledge of the eternal, and not of anything perishing and transient. That, he replied, may be readily allowed, and is true. Then, my noble friend, math will draw the soul towards truth and create the spirit of philosophy, and raise up that which is now unhappily allowed to fall down. Nothing will be more likely to have such an effect. Then nothing should be more sternly laid down than that the inhabitants of your fair city should by all means learn math. Moreover, science has indirect effects, which are not small. Of what kind, he said. There are the military advantages of which you spoke, I said, and in all departments of knowledge, as experience proves, anyone who has studied math is infinitely quicker of apprehension than one who has not. Yes indeed, he said, there is an infinite difference between them. Then shall we propose this as a second branch of knowledge which our youth will study? Let us do so, he replied. And suppose we make astronomy the third, what do you say? I am strongly inclined to it, he said. The observation of the seasons and of months and years is as essential to the general as it is to the farmer or sailor. I am amused, I said, at your fear of the world, which makes you guard against the appearance of insisting upon useless studies, and I quite admit the difficulty of believing that in every man there is an eye of the soul, which, when by other pursuits lost and dimmed, is by these purified and re-illumined, and is more precious far than ten thousand bodily eyes, for by it alone is truth seen. Now there are two classes of persons, one class of those who will agree with you and will take your words as a revelation, another class to whom they will be utterly unmeaning, and who will naturally deem them to be idle tales, for they see no sort of profit which is to be obtained from them. And so, my friend, you should decide right away with whom of the two you wish to argue. You will most likely say neither, nor that your main goal in carrying on the argument is your own improvement. At the same time, you do not begrudge others any benefit they may receive. I think I would prefer to argue mainly on my own behalf. Then take a step back, for we have gone wrong in the order of the sciences. What was the mistake? He said. After basic mathematics, I said, we immediately moved on to solids in revolution, instead of focusing on solids themselves whereas after the second dimension, the third, which deals with cubes and dimensions of depth, should have followed. That is true, Socrates, but it seems that very little is known about these subjects yet. Why, yes, I said, and for two reasons, first, no government supports them, this leads to a lack of motivation in pursuing them, and they are difficult, second, students cannot learn them unless they have a teacher. But then, a teacher can hardly be found, and even if he could, as things stand now, the students, who are very conceited, would not listen to him. However, that would be different if the entire state became the teacher of these studies and gave them honor, then students would want to come, and there would be continuous and earnest exploration, and discoveries would be made, since even now, disregarded as they are by the world, and lacking in understanding, and although none of their followers can explain their usefulness, these studies still captivate with their natural charm, and very likely, if they had the support of the state, they would someday come to light. Yes, he said, there is a remarkable charm in them. But I do not clearly understand the change in the order. First, you began with mathematics of plane surfaces. Yes, I said. And you placed astronomy next, and then you took a step backward? Yes, 
and I have delayed you with my haste, the absurd state of solid mathematics, which, in the natural order, should have followed, made me skip over this branch and move on to astronomy, or the motion of solids. True, he said. If the science we have omitted comes into existence, if encouraged by the state, let us continue with astronomy, which will be the fourth. The correct order, he replied. And now, Socrates, as you criticized the common way in which I praised astronomy before, I will give my praise in your own spirit. For everyone, as I believe, must see that astronomy compels the soul to look upwards and leads us from this world to another. Everyone but myself, I said, to everyone else this may be clear, but not to me. And what would you say, then? I would rather say that those who elevate astronomy into philosophy seem to make us look downwards and not upwards. What do you mean? He asked. You, I replied, having your mind a truly sublime conception of our knowledge of the things above. And I dare say that if a person were to throw his head back and study the intricate ceiling, you would still think that his mind was the perceiver and not his eyes. And you are very likely right, and I may be a simpleton, but, in my opinion, only knowledge of being and the unseen can make the soul look upwards, and whether a man gazes at the heavens or focuses on the ground, seeking to learn some particular sense, I would deny that he can learn, for nothing of that sort is a matter of science, his soul is looking downwards, not upwards, whether his way to knowledge is by water or by land, whether he floats or only lies on his back. I acknowledge, he said, the justice of your rebuke. Still, I would like to know how astronomy can be learned in a manner that is more conducive to the knowledge we are speaking of. I will tell you, I said, the starry heavens that we behold are displayed on a visible plane, and therefore, although they are the most beautiful and perfect visible things, they must necessarily be considered far inferior to the true motions of absolute swiftness and absolute slowness, which are relative to each other and contain within them the true number and every true figure. Now, these can be apprehended by reason and intelligence, but not by sight. True, he replied. The starry heavens should be used as a model and with the intention of attaining that higher knowledge. Their beauty is like the beauty of figures or pictures excellently crafted by the hand of Daedalus or some other great artist, which we may happen to see. Any mathematician who saw them would appreciate the excellence of their craftsmanship, but he would never think that he could find the true equal or the true double, or the truth of any other proportion in them. No, he replied, such an idea would be ridiculous. And will not a true astronomer have the same feeling when he looks at the movements of the stars? Will he not think that heaven and the things in heaven are created by the creator of them in the most perfect manner? but he will never imagine that the proportions of night and day, or both to the month, or of the month to the year, or of the stars to these and to one another, and any other things that are material and visible, can also be eternal and subject to no deviation, that would be absurd, and it is equally absurd to put so much effort into investigating their exact truth. I completely agree, although I never considered this before. Then, I said, in astronomy, just like in geometry, we should use problems and leave the heavens alone if we want to approach the subject in the right way and make reason useful. That, he said, is a task far beyond our current astronomers. Yes, I said, and there are many other things that must also be expanded in a similar way, if our legislation is to have any value. But can you think of any other suitable study? No, he said, not without thinking. Motion, I said, has many forms, not just one, two of them are obvious even to people like us with limited intelligence, and there are others, I imagine, that can be left to wiser individuals. But where are the two? There is a second, I said, which is the counterpart of the one already mentioned. And what might that be? The second, I said, would seem to be what the first is to the eyes, but for the ears, for I believe that just as the eyes are meant to look up at the stars, the ears are meant to hear harmonious sounds, and these are sister sciences, as the Pythagoreans say, and we, Glaucon, agree with them? Yes, he replied. But this, I said, is a laborious study, so we should go and learn from them, and they will tell us if there are any other applications of these sciences. 
At the same time, we must not lose sight of our own higher objective. What is that? There is a level of perfection that all knowledge should reach, and that our students should also achieve, and not fall short of, as I was saying they did in astronomy. Because in the science of harmony, as you probably know, the same thing happens. The teachers of harmony compare the sounds and consonances that are heard, and their efforts, like those of the astronomers, are in vain. Yes, by heaven. He said, and it's amusing to hear them talk about their condensed notes, as they call them, they put their ears close to the strings like people trying to catch a sound from their neighbor's wall, one group of them claiming to hear an intermediate note and having found the smallest interval that should be the unit of measurement, the others insisting that the two sounds have become the same, both sides relying on their ears rather than their understanding. You mean, I said, those gentlemen who pluck and stretch the strings on the instrument's pegs. I could continue the metaphor and speak in their manner about the strikes that the plectrum gives, and make accusations against the strings, both for being slow and fast to sound, but that would be tedious, so I will only say that those are not the men I'm referring to, and that I am talking about the Pythagoreans, whom I was just about to ask about harmony. Because they too are mistaken, like the astronomers, they study the numbers of the harmonies that are heard, but they never reach problems, that is to say, they never discover the natural harmonies of numbers, or reflect on why some numbers are harmonious and others are not. That, he said, is something beyond mortal knowledge. Something, I replied, that I would rather call useful, that is, if it is pursued with the intention of seeking the beautiful and good, but if pursued with any other intention, it is useless. Very true, he said. Now, when all these studies reach the point of interconnection and mutual consideration, and when they are examined in their relationships with each other, then, I think, but not until then, will the pursuit of them have value for our objectives, otherwise, there is no benefit in them. I suspect so, but you are talking about a vast undertaking, Socrates. What do you mean? I said, the prelude or what? Don't you know that all this is just the prelude to the actual strain that we must learn? Because you surely wouldn't consider a skilled mathematician to be a dialectician? Certainly not, he said, I have hardly ever known a mathematician who was capable of reasoning. But do you think that men who are unable to give and receive reasons will have the knowledge that we require of them? No, that cannot be assumed either. And so, Glaucon, I said, we have finally reached the hymn of dialectic. This is the strain that belongs to the intellect alone, but that the faculty of sight will still be found to imitate, because sight, as you may remember, was imagined by us to eventually behold the real animals and stars, and finally the sun itself. And so it is with dialectic. When a person embarks on the discovery of the absolute through the light of reason alone, without any assistance from the senses, and persists until through pure intelligence they arrive at the perception of the absolute good, they ultimately find themselves at the end of the intellectual world, just as in the case of sight, they reach the end of the visible. Exactly, he said. Then this is the progress that you call dialectic? True. But the release of the prisoners from chains, their transition from shadows to images and to the light, and their ascent from the underground cave to the sun, where they try in vain to look at animals and plants and the light of the sun, but can still perceive, with their weak eyes, the divine images in the water, which are the shadows of true existence, not shadows of images cast by a fire's light, which is only an image, compared to the sun, this ability to elevate the highest principle in the soul to the contemplation of the best in existence, which we can compare to raising the faculty that is the very light of the body to the sight of the brightest in the material and visible world, this ability is granted, as I was saying, by all that study and pursuit of the arts that has been described. I agree with what you're saying, he replied. It may be hard to believe, but from another point of view, it is even harder to deny. However, this is not a topic that should be discussed briefly. We will have to discuss it again and again. So, whether our conclusion is true or false, let's assume all of this and move on from the introduction to the main subject, and describe it in the same manner. Tell me, what is the nature of dialectic and what are its divisions? And what are the paths that lead to it? 
because these paths will also lead to our ultimate goal. Dear Glaucon, I said, you may not be able to follow me here, but I will do my best. And even though you may not see the absolute truth, you will at least see something close to reality, according to my understanding. Doubtless, he replied. But I must remind you that only dialectic has the power to reveal this truth, and only to those who have studied the previous sciences. You can be as competent in that statement as you were in the last one. And surely no one can argue that there is any other method of comprehending true existence or understanding the nature of things. The arts, in general, are concerned with the desires and opinions of men, or with production and construction. As for the mathematical sciences, such as geometry, they only dream about true being. They can never truly understand reality as long as they rely on unexamined hypotheses and cannot explain them. That's impossible, he said. Then dialectic, and only dialectic, goes directly to the first principle. It is the only science that eliminates hypotheses to establish a secure foundation. It lifts the soul's eye, which is buried in ignorance, with its gentle aid. And it uses the other sciences as assistance in its work. We call them sciences, but they should have a different name, implying greater clarity than opinion and less clarity than science. In our previous discussion, we called it understanding. But why should we argue about names when we have more important things to consider? Why indeed, he said, as long as the name expresses the thought clearly. At any rate, we are satisfied with having four divisions, two for intellect and two for opinion. We will call the first division science, the second understanding, the third belief, and the fourth perception of shadows. Opinion is concerned with becoming, and intellect is concerned with being. And so, we can establish a proportion, as being is to become, pure intellect is to opinion. And as intellect is to opinion, science is to belief, and understanding is to the perception of shadows. But let's postpone the further correlation and subdivision of the subjects of opinion and intellect, as that will be a much longer discussion. As far as I understand, he said, I agree. And do you also agree, I said, that the dialectician is someone who understands the essence of each thing? And someone who doesn't possess this understanding, and therefore cannot impart it, lacks intelligence to the same degree? Will you admit that? Yes, he said, how can I deny it? And you would say the same about the understanding of the good? Unless a person can rationally define and explain the idea of good, and can defend it against objections using absolute truth, they do not truly know the idea of good or any other good. They only grasp a shadow, if anything at all, which is given by opinion and not by science. They are like someone dreaming and sleeping through this life, before they are fully awake, and then they reach the world below and meet their final end. I completely agree with you on all of that, he said. And surely, you wouldn't want the future rulers of your ideal state, whom you are nurturing and educating, to be like posts with no reason in them, yet set an authority over important matters? Certainly not. Then we will establish a law that they must have an education that enables them to become skilled in asking and answering questions? Yes, he said, you and I will establish that law together. So, dialectic, as you agree, is the highest science, the crown of all other sciences. No other science can surpass it in the pursuit of knowledge. I agree, he said. But we still need to determine who will study these subjects and how they will be assigned. These are questions that we still need to consider. Yes, clearly, he said. Do you remember how the rulers were chosen before? I asked. Certainly, he said. The same types of individuals must still be chosen, and preference should be given to those who are the most reliable, courageous, and if possible, the most attractive. These individuals should have noble and generous personalities, as well as natural gifts that will facilitate their education. And what are these gifts? They should possess sharpness and quickness in acquiring knowledge, as the mind often becomes fatigued from intense study rather than physical exercise. The mental toil is solely their own and not shared with the body. Very true, he replied. 
Furthermore, the person we are searching for should have a good memory and be a hardworking individual who is dedicated to labor in any field. Otherwise, they will not be able to endure the physical exercise and intellectual discipline required of them. Certainly, he said, they must have natural gifts. The mistake currently is that those who study philosophy do not have a true calling, and this is the reason why philosophy has lost its reputation. Its true followers should embrace it wholeheartedly and not be half-hearted. What do you mean? Firstly, the person should not have a lackluster work ethic. I mean, they should not be partially industrious and partially idle. For example, they may love physical exercise, such as gymnastics and hunting, but hate the labor of learning, listening, or inquiring. On the other hand, they may have the opposite kind of laziness. Certainly, he said. And when it comes to truth, should we not consider a soul to be defective if it hates deliberate falsehood and becomes extremely angry with itself and others when lies are told, but is tolerant of unintentional falsehood and does not mind remaining ignorant? To be sure. And in terms of temperance, courage, magnificence, and every other virtue, should we not carefully distinguish between those who possess these virtues naturally and those who do not? Without discernment of such qualities, both states and individuals unknowingly make mistakes by appointing rulers and befriending individuals who lack some aspect of virtue and are therefore figuratively lame or illegitimate. That is very true, he said. All of these things must be carefully considered by us. If only those whom we introduce to this extensive system of education and training are sound in body and mind, justice herself will have no complaints against us. We will be the saviors of the Constitution and the state. However, if our pupils are of a different caliber, the opposite will occur, and philosophy will be subjected to even greater ridicule than it already endures. That would not be believable. Certainly not, I said. Yet, perhaps, in turning jest into seriousness, I am equally ridiculous. In what way? I had forgotten, I said, that we were not being serious and spoke with too much passion. When I saw philosophy being unjustly trampled by men, I couldn't help but feel anger towards those who brought disgrace upon her. And my anger made me too passionate. Indeed. I was listening and did not think so. But as the speaker, I felt that I was. And now let me remind you that although we previously chose old men, we must not do so in this case. Solon was mistaken when he said that a man can learn many things as he grows old, for he cannot learn much more than he can run much. Youth is the time for extraordinary effort. Of course. Therefore, subjects like calculation, geometry, and other elements of instruction that prepare for dialectic should be introduced to the mind in childhood. However, this should not be done under the notion of forcing our educational system. Why not? Because a free individual should not be enslaved in the pursuit of knowledge of any kind. Physical exercise, when mandatory, does no harm to the body. But knowledge that is acquired under compulsion does not take root in the mind. Very true. Then, my good friend, I said, do not use compulsion. Let early education be a form of amusement. This way, you will be better able to discover their natural inclinations. That is a very rational notion, he said. Do you remember that the children were also supposed to be taken to see the battle on horseback? And if there was no danger, they were to be brought close and, like young hounds, given a taste of blood? Yes, I remember. The same practice can be followed in all these things' labors, lessons, and dangers. Those who excel in all of them should be selected for further training. At what age? At the age when the necessary physical training is complete. The period of two or three years spent in this kind of training serves no other purpose. Sleep and exercise are not conducive to learning. The competition to determine who excels in physical exercises is one of the most important tests our youth are subjected to. Certainly, he replied. After that time, those who are chosen from the group of 20-year-olds will be promoted to higher honors. The sciences they learned in their early education, without any order, will now be brought together. 
they will be able to see the natural relationship between these sciences and true existence. Yes, he said, that is the only kind of knowledge that takes root and lasts. Yes, I said. And the ability to acquire such knowledge is the main indicator of dialectical talent. Those with a comprehensive mind are always the most skilled in dialectic. I agree with you, he said. These, I said, are the points that you must consider. Those who possess the greatest understanding, and who are most dedicated to their studies, as well as their military and other assigned duties, should be chosen by you from the select class and given higher honors. You will need to test them using dialectic, to determine which of them is capable of relinquishing the use of sight and the other senses, and, in the pursuit of truth, attaining absolute being. And here, my friend, great caution is required. Why great caution? We'll try them. Do you not notice, I said, the great harm that dialectic has caused? What harm, he asked. The students of this art are filled with lawlessness. Quite true, he said. Do you think that there is anything so unnatural or inexcusable in their case? Or will you make allowances for them? In what way should I make allowances? I want you, I said, to imagine a hypothetical son who was raised in great wealth. He is part of a large and prosperous family and has many flatterers. When he grows up, he discovers that his alleged parents are not his real parents but he is unable to discover who his real parents are. Can you guess how he will behave towards his flatterers and his supposed parents, both when he is ignorant of the false relationship and when he knows the truth? Or shall I guess for you? If you please. Then I would say that while he is ignorant of the truth, he will likely honor his supposed parents and his supposed relations more than the flatterers. He will be less inclined to neglect them in times of need or to do or say anything against them. And he will be less willing to disobey them in any important matter. He will. But once he discovers the truth, I imagine that he will diminish his honor and regard for them and become more devoted to the flatterers. Their influence over him will greatly increase. He will now live according to their ways and openly associate with them. Unless he has an unusually good disposition, he will no longer concern himself with his supposed parents or other relations. Well, all that is very likely. But how does this image apply to the disciples of philosophy? In this way, you know that there are certain principles of justice and honor that were taught to us in childhood, and under their authority, we were raised to obey and honor them. That is true. There are also opposing maxims and habits of pleasure that flatter and attract the soul, but do not influence those of us who have a sense of what is right. We continue to obey and honor the maxims of our fathers. Indeed. Now, when a man is in this state, and the questioning spirit asks what is fair or honorable, and he answers as the legislator has taught him, and then many different arguments refute his words, until he is driven to believe that nothing is honorable or just or good, do you think that he will still honor and obey those principles as before? Impossible. And when he no longer considers them honorable and natural, and he fails to discover the truth, can he be expected to pursue any life other than one that satisfies his desires? He cannot. And from being a keeper of the law, he becomes a breaker of it? Undoubtedly. Now, all of this is very natural in students of philosophy, as I have described, and also, as I was just saying, quite understandable. Yes, he said, and I would add, pitiable. Therefore, in order to prevent your feelings from being moved to pity for our citizens who are now thirty years old, every care must be taken when introducing them to dialectic. Certainly. There is a danger that they might taste the sweet delight too early. For youngsters, as you may have observed, when they first get a taste, they argue for amusement and are always contradicting and refuting others, imitating those who refute them. Like puppies, they rejoice in pulling and tearing at anyone who comes near them. Yes, he said, there is nothing they like better. And when they have achieved many victories and suffered many defeats, they quickly and vehemently stop believing anything they believed before. As a result, not only do they, but philosophy itself and everything related to it, 
tend to have a bad reputation with the rest of the world. Too true, he said. But when a man begins to grow older, he will no longer engage in such madness. He will imitate the dialectician who seeks truth, not the heuristic who contradicts for amusement. The greater moderation of his character will increase, rather than diminish, the honor of the pursuit. Very true, he said. And did we not make special provision for this, when we said that the disciples of philosophy should be orderly and steadfast, not just any random aspirant or intruder? Very true. Suppose I said that the study of philosophy was to replace physical exercise and be diligently and earnestly pursued exclusively for twice the number of years spent in bodily exercise. Would that be enough? Would you say six or four years, he asked. I would say five years, I replied. At the end of that time, they must be sent back down into the den and compelled to hold any military or other office that young men are qualified for. This way, they will gain experience of life, and we can see if, when faced with temptation, they will stand firm or falter. How long will this stage of their lives last, they asked. Fifteen years, I answered. And when they reach the age of fifty, those who have survived and distinguished themselves in every action and branch of knowledge will finally reach their fulfillment. It is now time for them to raise their souls to the universal light that illuminates all things and behold the absolute good. This is the pattern by which they will govern the state, the lives of individuals, and the rest of their own lives. Philosophy will be their main pursuit, but when the time comes, they will also engage in politics and rule for the public good, not as if performing heroic actions, but simply as a matter of duty. Once they have raised the next generation of leaders and left them in their place to govern the state, they will depart to the islands of the blessed and dwell there. The city will honor them with public memorials and sacrifices, considering them as demigods if the Pythian oracle consents. If not, they will still be recognized as blessed and divine. You are a sculptor, Socrates, and you have created faultless statues of our governors, Glaucon remarked. Yes, Glaucon, and of our governesses as well, I said. For you must not think that what I have been saying applies only to men and not to women, as far as their natures allow. You are right, he agreed. Since we have made them equal participants in all things. Well, I continued, you would agree that what has been said about the state and the government is not just a dream. It is difficult, but not impossible, and can only be achieved in the way that has been described. When true philosopher kings are born in a state, one or more of them, they will despise the honors of this present world, considering them mean and worthless. They will value righteousness and the honor that comes from it above all else. They will regard justice as the greatest and most necessary thing, and they will be its ministers. Their principles will be elevated when they establish order in their own city. How will they proceed? They will begin by sending all the inhabitants of the city who are over ten years old out into the country. They will take possession of their children who will not be influenced by the habits of their parents. These children will be trained in the habits and laws that we have given them. In this way, the state and constitution we have discussed will achieve happiness most quickly and easily. The nation with such a constitution will prosper the most. Yes, that is the best way, Glaucon agreed. And I think, Socrates, you have described very well how such a constitution might come into being, if ever. Enough then of the perfect state and the man who embodies it. There is no difficulty in understanding how we will describe him, I said. I agree, Glaucon replied. I think nothing more needs to be said. Summary of Chapter 7 in Chapter 7, Plato delves deeper into the philosopher's education and the nature of philosophical enlightenment. The primary theme of this chapter is the philosopher's journey toward the highest form, the form of the good, and the challenges they face in their pursuit of truth. The chapter opens with Socrates, describing the philosopher as someone who possesses an innate love for knowledge and the truth. Philosophers are driven by a sense of wonder and curiosity, which propels them on their quest for wisdom and enlightenment. 
Plato introduces the concept of dialectical reasoning, a method of inquiry that involves rigorous questioning and critical examination of ideas. Through dialectical dialogue, philosophers are trained to move beyond mere opinions and reach a deeper understanding of the forms and the ultimate reality. To illustrate the philosopher's education, Plato uses the famous analogy of the ship. He compares the city to a ship sailing on the sea of existence, with the philosopher as the navigator. The non-philosophical rulers and citizens represent those who lack true knowledge and are guided by sensory perceptions and opinions. The philosopher, with their grasp of the forms and the form of the good, possesses the true knowledge needed to steer the ship toward its ultimate destination of justice and the well-being of the city. The chapter also explores the challenges and criticisms that philosophers face from those who do not understand their pursuit. Socrates discusses how philosophers may be seen as useless dreamers or even ridiculed by the masses. However, he argues that their role is indispensable for the well-being of the city, as they are the ones who possess the knowledge to guide it toward justice and the ultimate truth. Throughout Chapter 7, Plato underscores the vital importance of philosophy and the philosopher's role in society. The pursuit of knowledge, the rigorous training in dialectical reasoning, and the understanding of the form of the good are central to the philosopher's mission. This chapter serves as a testament to the transformative power of philosophy and its potential to lead society toward justice and enlightenment.